You are here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. What you feel. I feel it. It's the Matrix. It's approach to regression. It's examples in R. Examples in SAS. Oh, thank goodness, it's the last week. It's the bread and butter, baby, what's your chance? Greetings Bio 6611. We've reached the final week of the semester and we're going to talk about a matrix approach to linear regression. We'll first walk through a lot of just the formulas and deriving of some of these features we've already looked at from an algebraic perspective. We'll introduce a brief example and then end with an appendix of some code that we can use to calculate matrix algebra and other functions in both SAS and R noting we'll have subsequent videos to also walk through those with each of the respective programs. So let's jump in to doing linear regression in the format of matrices. Before we do that though, let's review some of the notation we need for conducting this analysis. So one of our conventions for identifying matrices and vectors is to use a bold face for the letters. And then elements of that matrix are denoted by a lowercase letter with subscripts. For example, we have here at the very top, our matrix A has R rows and C columns. We would then designate a specific element from that matrix as lower uh, case A sub IJ, where that would be the element stored in the ith row in the jth column. Likewise, we can also specify either column or row vectors um, where B is an example of a row vector where there is one row and then C columns, or C is an example of a column vector where there's a single column but multiple rows. And at below here we can just see an example for a three by two matrix where we can just denote that lowercase a sub one one is that first element here. And a sub two one is going to represent that second element and so on. So with that brief background of what our notation means, we can look at how we can write our regression framework with matrices. And really so far throughout this semester, we've discussed things above this line we drew here in an algebraic perspective where we have subscripts denoting the ith observation. And so person I or observation I has an outcome Y. We have some true beta coefficient with respect to each of the predictors X. And we have this epsilon term because this is our true regression model, which is distributed normally with mean zero and variance sigma squared y given x. However, instead of using this algebraic perspective, it can be more efficient to use matrices and vectors. For example, we can write this equation here as our boldface capital Y for that column vector of outcomes, um, the boldface x for the information contained for all of our beta coefficients and predictors, beta itself and epsilon. And we see defined below here as well, we have that column vector for y, where for each person one through n or observation, one through n, we have their recorded outcome. We then have our, what we'll see in the next slide is called a design matrix, where there is a row for each observation, one through n, and then we have a column corresponding to the intercept and then each one of our predictors. So that's why we see here we have this little p plus one um, instead of just p to account for that intercept as well. Likewise over here then we see that for our beta coefficients it also is a column vector but this time instead of length n it's length p plus one and then we also have our potential error or epsilon term for each one of our observations. We can then plug in all these observations or these resulting matrices and vectors here below and we actually have a similar setup to what we had before, but we can note now that we can extract that information in this visual or matrix format to note that that top row, for example, where we have Y1 and then the corresponding values represent the observed values for those predictors for that first observation. As we mentioned on the previous slide, X has a special role in what's known as the design matrix. In this case, each column represents the information contributed by a certain observation. For example, our first column is a constant value of one because it represents that in most cases we have an intercept term in our model or our beta naught estimate. Then the rest of the columns in our design matrix are going to represent beta one, 
up to beta sub p, or our pth predictor of interest. If we were fitting something like a cell means model, that's where we would exclude that first column of all ones, or in any other model where we might wish to exclude an intercept. It's also possible, I think, in the case of a design matrix, to be more apparent at why missing data is such a tricky problem to deal with. One might naively think that, well, if I'm missing maybe one observation like this x sub 2, 2, what's the big deal? But as we'll see in the following slides using matrix algebra and actually doing the calculations, if it was an n, a, and r, or blank by doing by hand, we wouldn't know what to plug into that value, and it would just stop all of our calculations in their tracks. Another special matrix that deserves a little more attention is what's known as the hat matrix, and in some cases it's also called a projection matrix. This is a square n by n matrix, and so it's the number of observations, um, both for the number of rows and columns, which maps the vector of our observed outcome or values into the vector of fitted values. We've previously alluded to its existence when discussing different types of residuals and also the concept of leverage in diagnostics where we've denoted it previously with our lowercase either h sub i i or just h sub i for that diagonal element. The hat matrix itself is the orthogonal or perpendicular projection of our outcome vector y onto the column space of x. But for our purposes in 611, we'll just focus on the fact that it has this calculation which is based on the design matrix in its various forms, where we have the design matrix x times here in this inner piece x transpose x and the inverse of that term times then finally the transpose of x. We can also note like the algebraic approach we can derive the beta coefficients and what their formulas would be in the perspective of our matrix approach. For example we know that the sums of square due to error our SSE is represented by the sums of our observed outcome minus the predicted or fitted value y hat squared. However, in matrix form, we can write it like this, as our vector y of our outcomes minus the design matrix x times the vector of our beta coefficients transpose times that term again. In other words, squaring the term in the way we think of it with matrices. Like before, we can then take the partial derivative and solve with respect to each one of our beta coefficients. So we see here we've taken the derivative of that sums of square error with respect to beta. One of the nice things here though is that we're dealing with this vector of beta terms all at once. And so we can actually, instead of deriving each one separately at this stage, we can use this approach to end up, we see down below here, add an estimate for beta hat that is x transpose x inverse times x transpose times y. And we can use this then for inference once we have these two components of the design matrix and our outcomes of interest. Now one caveat to make is that this estimate of beta hat is only possible if we assume that x transpose x inverse exists. If it does not exist, we would need to use a generalized inverse in the case of a singular matrix. Generalized inverses have some but not all properties of the ordinary inverse we've discussed previously. Now, in the case of linear regression, this isn't as big of a concern, and we have a quick rule of thumb that we can use, in that our x transpose x inverse will exist if the regressors are linearly independent. Or in other words, you can't solve uh, one column of the design matrix x based on some combination of the other columns. If that is the case, then we would have a singular matrix, and our easiest solution would be to remove that redundant information. So before seeing some examples later and extending this generally to multiple linear regression, let's take a look at simple linear regression and we can then verify some of our previously derived and shown properties. For example, we know in simple linear regression we only have one predictor here, this x sub 1 up to x sub n. So our design matrix is an n by 2 matrix. We can then note if we write out generally what this is, we have x transpose x here, and so we have our two terms which we could multiply and actually do the math ourselves, but what we'll see is that we end up with these summary statistics of interest that we previously noted, where we have the sample size, the sum of our predictor x, and the sum of our predictor x squared across all of our observations. We can also note as well that if we take x transpose times y, those 
that matrix and that vector, we end up with our other summary statistics of interest, the sum of our outcome y and the sum of x times y. As well as noting that in the case here, x transpose y is really just the sum of our y outcome squared. We then note though that based on the earlier formulas, we do need to solve for x transpose x inverse, which also will have some recognizable components um, that we've seen previously. For example, we see here that if we calculate that inverse, we end up with something that looks like one over the sums of squares with respect to our x per single predictor. And then we'll have the, in the top left, or one one position of this vec matrix, um, the sum of our xi squared divided by the sample size. On the off diagonal, we have the negative mean of our predictor x. And in the bottom right, then we'll just have a value of one. And we can note some of these properties by calculating in the process of getting that inverse, the determinant of x transpose x. But tying this all together, I think the nifty thing to note here is that we have beta uh, hat that we're trying to estimate that vector of, and we actually plug in our inverse here in that x transpose y component that we had on the previous slides, we see that we get the same summary statistics that we derived algebraically previously. And so once again, if we have that summary information, we can actually plug in the mean of y, the mean of x, and the sums of squares for x by y and x by x, and get our estimates for beta not hat and beta one hat. And more generally, this will extend the case of multiple linear regression. We have those multiple predictors to solve for and estimate the beta coefficients of. Interesting to note, just a few facts that carry on from what we saw previously with our algebraic approach, but we haven't necessarily expressed in explicit detail. We know that beta hat will be an unbiased estimator of beta if, like our assumption is, the expected value of epsilon is equal to zero. And so here on this slide in this top part here, we see that a little work to show that that is true under our assumption of that epsilon term being centered at zero. We can also note that by the Gauss-Markov theorem, and this is linked here, and so you can click on this to go to the Wikipedia article, but we know from that theorem that beta hat, that vector, will be the best linear unbiased estimator, or blue, of beta. And so again, getting back to that idea that while there's many ways we could pick a given line to fit to our data, the estimates we arrive through this approach, either via matrices or algebraically deriving, are the best unbiased estimators we could come up with. Additionally, we can also note um, that there's some relationships that beta hat is also the maximum likelihood estimator and the minimum variance unbiased estimator of beta as well. But those are some concepts and ideas that are a little beyond the scope of what we'll talk about this semester. Carrying on with the variety of just equations we can use to estimate different things that may be of interest to us, we can note that the vector of fitted y values, y hat, will correspond um, to the observed values y via our equation here, where we see that y hat is really equal, of course, to our observed predictors times the estimated beta coefficients. We can then plug in our beta hat formula we derived on the previous slide, and note our friend, the hat matrix, actually now shows up here by then taking our design matrix terms and going there. One of the nifty things about this is just to note that if we know what the hat matrix is and our observed y values, we can, from this stage, calculate our predicted value or fitted values y hat. We can also leverage this relationship to write the residuals in a variety of ways. The first is that we can take the difference of our observed and predicted vector of outcomes. We can plug in that definition for y hat, for x beta hat. We can further substitute in this definition of the hat matrix times y, which then simplifies to the identity matrix i minus the hat matrix times our observed values. Again, there's just multiple ways we can calculate things like our residuals for the observed difference or deviance from our fitted regression line. Also of use to note as well at the bottom of our slide are various equations for the sums of square for our error, the model or our regression equation, and the total sums of square written primarily in the context of our matrix approach.
And we'll see here that things like the sums of square error will be useful for still calculating that mean square error or the estimate of sigma squared y given x. Other information that's important for us to calculate to use for inference is the variances and covariances. And previously we discussed that we can use this information to calculate the difference between different combinations of our beta coefficients. But first we should remind ourselves that if x is a random variable and a was a constant, we have this relationship where we know that the variance of a times x is equal to the, that constant squared when we pull it out times the variance of x. Similarly for matrices, we have a rule where we say if A is a compatible matrix that would work with respect to whatever X is, the variance of A times X will be equal to that matrix A times the variance of X or the variance covariance matrix of X times A transpose. Noting that sometimes people will denote the variance covariance matrix of x as sigma sub x or sigma sub whatever the matrix we're trying to estimate is. We can also note that like our assumption in the case of linear regression, if we assume that the variance is equal to sigma squared y given x, then the variance for beta hat can be calculated as the MSE times that design matrix of x transpose x inverse. This is a nice shortcut again because once we have these quantities calculated, we can quickly get the variance covariance matrix or sometimes known as a dispersion matrix to pull information from. For example, to calculate maybe contrasts by hand. We can note as well that with that MSE, we have the sums of square that we defined on the previous slide there, but we just like previously in our definition in the algebraic approach, we'll divide by our n minus p minus one, where n is our sample size, p is the number of predictors in the model, and that one is there to account for the fact that we have that intercept term as well. We can also draw connection to the idea of confidence and prediction intervals, which we discussed previously. For example, if we have a given value of x, which we'll just denote as little x naught, we could calculate the variance based on these equations and formulas and then plug in for a confidence or prediction interval. For example, the variance for a fitted value or that expected mean for a given value of x equal to x naught, we can literally take our formulas that we saw in the previous slide and we can just put in this idea of x naught here. And the reason we have x naught transpose and x naught is that technically we could actually calculate multiple predicted values at once. And that is an advantage of this matrix framework that we don't have to algebraically go through one by one by one or code up some sort of for loop structure. We can also note it's really easy then to also modify the statement for the predicted value of y given that value of x naught for a specific individual or a specific new person we wish to predict from the model, where now we just simply add in that one plus to our uh, equation above, which accounts for that greater variability introduced by our single observation and that estimated MSE. But with this information then we would have an estimate of that variability and could calculate something like a 95% prediction interval for future observations related to the model we fit. One final note here that we won't walk through in too great of detail is just a derivation of the variance of beta hat based on our matrix notation. And we can note uh, just for the sake of brevity here that we have these various steps that we get through to get to our conclusion that the MSE times X transpose X inverse is the appropriate estimate for the variance in this matrix approach. So with that information, let's take a look at an example um, doing a calculation for a multiple linear regression model with matrices. In this case, we're going to have a systolic blood pressure outcome with predictors of birth weight and age for infants who were measured, and we have a sample size of 16. What we see below here is our regression equation in matrix format. We have our outcome vector y, the design matrix x, our beta vector with our p plus one, or in this case, three beta coefficients. And because this represents the true regression model, we also have our vector of epsilons. 
with this information, we can calculate then all of these various quantities that we've seen in the previous slides. And we'll note in a subsequent lecture how we can efficiently do this in R and or SAS. But for the sake of just presenting these summaries, we see here that if we were to calculate that design matrix X transpose X, we would have the resulting three by three matrix. X transpose Y, we have our three by one matrix. Y transpose Y, or essentially the sum of all of our outcomes squared, is this one by one matrix, or really a scalar. And also we can calculate as well the inverse down below here of X transpose X. All of these then will be useful for calculating various things like our beta coefficients, the variability, and things to summarize uh, the performance like a test statistic or p-value. Tying together all those different components now, we can see how easy it is, relatively speaking, to estimate all of our beta coefficients with this matrix approach. For example, we see that we calculated on that previous slide these two quantities of X transpose X inverse and X transpose Y which we see correspond here to our three by three matrix and our three by one matrix over here. Once we then multiply these two together, we see we arrive at our estimated re regression equation where now we can state that y hat equals 53.45 plus 0 0.13 times our weight plus 5.89 times our age in days. And so again, we very quickly and efficiently got our fitted regression equation that we can use for prediction or, as we'll see in the next few slides, inference. However, to do inference on our beta coefficients, we will need to calculate that variance-covariance matrix. We see here, though, that again, it's a fairly straightforward process once we have the necessary components calculated. For example, we already have this information for X transpose X inverse, and we have the formula to calculate that we renote here below the estimated MSE. Once we have that information, we can simply plug it in, and in this case, because it's really a matrix times a scalar, we then see in our next step here, each one of our values is just modified by that estimated 6.1463 MSE. With this information again, we can now note that the estimated variability or variance for beta naught hat our intercept is 20.5, and we can take, for example, the square root of that for the standard error. So now let's look at actually doing a calculation for one of our specific beta coefficients and calculate a t-statistic and a p-value. For example, maybe we're interested in the estimate of beta hat 1 or the weight of our infants. To do this, we can create a vector to pick off this coefficient and its variance from our corresponding matrices. In this case here, we might define something like the vector C, where we have terms that correspond to our beta naught, beta one, and beta two terms. But once we identify which one we wish to extract from, and this is also similar to an approach we can do if we have contrast and we wish to combine these terms in different ways, what we can do is that we would take to get beta hat 1, we would just use our new vector here, 0, 1, 0, times that beta hat vector. And where we can see here that each one of these terms will correspond to its different component. And since two of them are 0, it's pretty easy to ignore those and just note we have that estimate of 0.1256 for our beta hat 1. Likewise, in a slightly more complex approach, but for the variance of that term, we can multiply by the corresponding contrast or vector we wish to extract the information for. Going through those steps, we end up with here an estimate specifically for the variance of beta hat 1 being equal to that 0 0.001179. Or like uh, before, we could look at the variance covariance matrix on the previous slide and manually extract the relevant information. But now that we have all of those components, we can then calculate our t-statistic by just plugging in those values that we calculated. For example, we see here that we have our matrix and vector notation here where we could automatically use that, or we can plug in the estimates once we have them. But we see we get a predicted uh, t-value or t-statistic to use of 3.657. We can also reference the fact that we know this is distributed with the t distribution with our n minus p minus 1 degrees of freedom, and so we could also calculate a p-value here for our conclusion.
And ultimately, we could check this as well just to see if we did all this correctly and all this matrix mumbo jumbo was worth it by comparing our model fit using LM. And we do see, in fact, that for our weight coefficient, we have a beta hat estimate that matches what we desire. The square root of our variance matches the standard error, which then leads us to the correct T value, as well as a matched or identical P value. And so with that information, we can see that if we needed to, or we want to calculate some values, maybe for new modeling approaches or to explore different relationships, we could use matrices instead of trying to algebraically derive things um, for our quantities. Before closing, we'll just briefly discuss some of the code language for SAS and R for calculating matrices, noting that in a subsequent lecture set, we'll see these examples in a walkthrough. In SAS, we can use the PROC IML procedure to complete matrix operations. For example, we see at the top here, if we wanted to create, let's say, a matrix uh, with two by two, so two rows, two columns, a square matrix A that had three, four in the top, and two, two in the bottom row, we would do something like we see the syntax here of three, four, comma, two, two. And likewise, we can make another matrix B of the same size to maybe do some matrix operations on. What we see below here then for some common operations that we've described or might need is that if we're adding or subtracting or multiplying, the notation or syntax is pretty similar to what we would do if we just had two scalars. We can use the plus symbol, the minus symbol, or the asterisk for multiplication. If we wish to calculate the transpose of our matrix, we use this grave accent or this little back tick here. Then for calculating things like the trace, determinant, or inverse, we actually have functions that are written out here as trace of A, det of A, and inv of A. With one little note that if you do happen to need a generalized inverse because maybe you have a singular matrix, we simply can use g inv within SAS. Within R, we have a different set of notation we will use. And this is things that are built into the base of R in some cases, or in other situations, we may need to leverage some packages. But we've seen previously that we can create matrices using the matrix function. Here again, it would create a two by two square matrix for A with three and four in the top row and two and two in the bottom. To add and subtract two matrices, we have standard notation of just the plus and minus or subtraction symbol. However, a big difference within R that we need to be aware of is that for matrix multiplication, we use this A percent sign asterisk percent sign B. This will then actually do matrix multiplication, whereas if we use just A asterisk B or A times B, we'll actually end up doing element-wise multiplication where A11 will be times B11, A12 times B12, and so on for two matrices that are identically sized. If we wish to calculate the transpose of a matrix, we simply take T and then put within our parentheses A or the matrix of interest. The trace, we will need to borrow either the matrix.trace or the TR functions from the psych or matrix calc packages to calculate those values. The determinant is built in though to base R as det A. And then the inverse will be calculated through solve A where in the case if we needed a generalized inverse, one example is in the mass package, we can use GNV for that calculation. And so with this introduction to matrices behind us, we'll see in our final lecture videos of the semester, some examples of the actual code and then uh, walking through the steps of doing these calculations with matrices in both SAS and R for our given data set that we saw from Rosner for the infant, systolic blood pressure, birth weight, and age.